My name is Mary Demaris. My husband was Captain Darrell A. Demaris. In 1953, he knew he was due to be inducted into the draft. So instead of going in the Army, he enlisted in the Navy, 1953, the year we were married. So right after we were married, he went off to Newport, Rhode Island for officer training. And I joined him after a month and we lived there through a wonderful summer in Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> Perfect place, very nice. We lived in a, I had a very small apartment in an old house right on K Street. And of course, he only got out on the weekends. So we had an enjoyable time there. He knew what he wanted to do. And I was, I was happy with that. I had had an older brother who was in World War II, was a Navy pilot. So I sort of knew about the Navy life. He didn't enjoy the beginning of it, you know. But, uh, but you know, they just went to school every day. And he was a very good student. He had been uh, the top student in his high school class and in one of the top students in his Drexel University College class. So he was good for studying everything. He didn't have any trouble. And so he didn't have any homework on weekends. He just got off at Saturday noon and then had to go back Sunday night. He was sent to the Pentagon. Wow. And he was in mm -hmm. some office that had to do with naval intelligence in the Pentagon. Um, I don't know exactly <laughs> what the title of his office would have been but it was probably a staff there. So he was there for um, about three years. And uh, at that time, he decided he would get out because his father had had a heart attack and he owned a business in Ocean City, New Jersey, and he wanted my husband to come back and work for him. So we went back there for two or three years, and then he told his father he didn't like work. He made it look like he had to go back in the Navy. At that time, Vietnam had started, I guess, something that time period. He went back in and he had a lot of friends and intelligence, so they um, agreed that he ought to come back and work for them. So he went to um, Fort Meade. So then we moved back to Silver Spring. And we lived there, <clears throat> I think he was in uh, Fort, at Fort Meade about three years, and then we went to Hawaii. And he was on Sinka uh, Pack Fleet staff as an intelligence officer. Well, by that time we had two children, <laughs> and a boy and a girl. <clears throat> so we planned a nice trip across the country by car went to visit a lot of people we knew, including my sister who lived in Montana at the time. And then we went to San Diego, or San Francisco, and we got on a ship there to go to Hawaii. It was a Navy ship. And it was very nice, very informal, a nice room for the four of us together, you know, in bunks. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a nice crossing. <laughs> he was stationed at the uh, uh, Singpak Fleet, and uh, that's in Makalapa, and um, outside of Honolulu, you know. And uh, we lived in housing there. We were very lucky to get a nice house. Cape Heart Housing was brand new. We had a little house there. It was like 10 minutes from where he worked, which is very convenient. And uh, first year, I ch let's see, my son, I think, started school there. My daughter was a year younger. She didn't start till the next year. But they both, you know, really enjoyed it there. 
we enjoy the beach. I think he might have been a lieutenant. I don't think he was a lieutenant commander. Yeah. Yeah. The base was nice. They had a nice PX. Um, and the school was convenient. It was, I don't know, it was kind of a, some of the local kids could go to the school. I remember that. Well, he did do a, go on one trip to visit uh, people that were there, though they knew each other. But uh, mostly it was, sometimes he'd get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning, say, and he'd have to go into the office and he had to call up uh, planes to go out and watch what the Russians were doing with um, missiles in the South Pacific somewhere. But I never, you know, that's all I knew about. <laughs> he had to get up at two in the morning and go to work and call these other planes out. He went to Baltimore. He had the investigative office in Baltimore, you know, where they had they had civilian agents that went, you know, out in the neighborhoods to uh, interview neighbors of people who were applying for security uh, clearances and things like that. And we lived out in Maryland, near uh, in a place called all the U.S. states. It was a housing area out there where Columbia now is, you know, the big city of Columbia. That was not there then. It was pretty much out in the country. So we had a little bit of a drive to work, but we, we liked it there. The kid, my children went to the school there, the grade school. And so we were there for two years. And then we went to London. That was great. <laughs> that was good. He was right down on Audley Street, right across from the uh, embassy, the American embassy. And they had a uh, staff there, and the admiral was the elder, Admiral McCain. And he was an interesting character. <laughs> I personally did not have much to do with him once in a while, but he used to run through the lobby in his tennis shorts and out to play tennis. And he did, his wife was a twin, so every once in a while she showed up and uh, I mean I didn't ever had very much to do with them really. The big parties probably you know where you see lots of people. Well when he was in London uh, working for this Admiral McCain, the son came to visit his parents on his way to Vietnam and the Admiral brought his son around to meet everybody and let them interview him. So he got to interview the young McCain before he went off to war and two weeks later was when he was shot down. And of course that really upset the father. I mean he was beside himself I guess. But he feels that was very um, interesting being able to talk to uh, the son McCain. But um, yes, it was a very enjoyable place to live. We lived in a small town outside London on the, a, the uh, A40 that goes to Oxford, a little town called Gerrard's Cross. The uh, metro didn't go there, but the train did. So my husband used to drive the train to work you know, and then walk the rest of the way to Audley Street, which is good for him. <laughs> they adapted very well, <clears throat> I would say. They went to an American school in England. Um, there was an Air Force base farther out. I'm trying to think of the name of it. So they, they rode a bus with a military bus. It took them to the school, to Gerard's Cross. It was about a half hour ride.
and um, no, they did well. They were pretty good students. Our neighborhood was mixed, so there were two or three American people living in this town with, you know, right in our neighborhood. And um, I don't think they knew too many English children. They sort of have different routines. They, you know, like Americans out, running all over people's yards and everything, playing all over the neighborhood. You didn't do that there. People did not like you running on their lawn or something like that. So they mostly um, were friendly with other American children that went to their school and lived right on our street. We came to, um, in an office in the Pentagon, so he was still involved in intelligence. And then, oh, he did get a very nice job uh, managing the attaches, because all the different navies sent attaches to Washington, and likely, likewise, the, the American Navy sent attaches to foreign countries. He never was an attache, but he was in charge of the organization of the attaches. So we went to lots of parties <laughs> of different countries and got to know, you know, a lot of different people that way from different countries and different navies. When he was an ensign stationed in the Pentagon, he was a uh, you know, on a, somebody's staff, you know, I didn't know much about it in those days. But a person who was in their office was the Marine pilot, Don Conroy's father. Everybody hated him. He was really not nice. But I probably have and my husband's little goodbye party, you know, in the Pentagon when he was going to get out and had all the staff standing around. Somewhere I have a slide picture of Conroy's father. <laughs> uh, when he first retired, he couldn't decide what to do. He sat around the house, retired, and for a year, until one day, someone called him up and said they knew he was a bridge player. He had some master points. And they said, why don't you come and play bridge with our group? And he said, well, I don't have a partner. Well, I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> I wasn't interested in spending my life playing bridge. So they said, no, it doesn't matter. Just come and you'll meet people. That was the beginning of it. That's all he did then. He played different groups every day. It was like going to work. And got to know, you know, a lot of other bridge players and played in tournaments and, you know, enjoyed it very much. 